Hi, this is Beyond the Red Carpet. I'm Francine Brokaw. And let me ask you a question. When you go to a movie, do you get up and leave when all the credits start to roll at the end? I mean, those things can take maybe four minutes or even longer. And if you do stay, do you always wonder what it is these people are doing on the movie set? Well, let me tell you that it takes a lot of people to make one movie. With me today is Nick Brokaw, filmmaker who has had a lot of experience in a lot of these jobs that we're going to talk about today. Why don't you uh, welcome, first of all. Thank you. Uh, why don't you talk about your career a little bit and how you got started? Well, first off, thank you again for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's and fun. Uh, yeah. it's great to see you again. Um, I have been working in the film industry for approximately nine years now as an assistant director and working my way, way up through the production uh, hierarchy. Um, uh, so you've I've climbed the ranks, that's uh, definitely. And, and still climbing, but <laughs> um, in, I've been interacting with um, crew members for all these years and getting an understanding of the different uh, obligations they have and what their different departments uh, provide for the mm -hmm. film's collective effort. And that is the main thing about um, the filmmaking process. It is one huge collaboration, one big team effort, and uh, the more efficient each of these departments run, the better the film will turn out. Yeah, like they say, it takes a village, but this time it takes a whole city for making a movie. It's a city. It's, a, <laughs> it's an army with a lot of different divisions and companies within it. and. Um, each role is completely essential to the uh, uh, success of okay, that well, project. Excuse me, le but let's talk about the most important role in the crew, craft services. <laughs> the food is yeah. most important for everybody, right? It, completely. Um, the morale of each and every person uh, depends on that craft service snack, uh, yeah. that table, and the catering as well. Um, you'd be surprised how far that, that goes uh, in all seriousness. But um, you always hear stories about actors or, or people with larger egos on set flipping out about the, uh, the craft service table not having the type of snack they want, which in part can be true. But um, what the role that they provide for the cast and crew on a daily basis is um, not to be taken lightly. No, it's good. I've, I've tasted <laughs> a lot of different sets, the craft services, and they're pretty good food. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. And especially in commercials, um, when they have a, a shorter amount of time that they have to provide food and, and whatnot for, they're mm -hmm. able to uh, up the budget quite a bit. And I've had some of the best sushi platters of my life on film sets before. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we know the director instructs the actor where to go and what to say, basically. Right? Well, they have the script. But what, what does the director of photography, DP, do? Yes. So a director is not only um, obligated to telling the story in his or her vision, um, they answer to the executive producers and, and those who hired them to direct that, that film if it, or given them the green light to make that film. Mm -hmm. um, they also mainly directly interact with the cinematographer, like you said, or DP, D-O-P, if you're on a British set, director of photography, also known as the cinematographer. Um, the cinematographer handles everything related to the visual experience, the capturing of the image itself, um, and hence the, the camera department, all the, the crew members who run the camera equipment. Mm -hmm. um, and the hierarchy also spreads down everything that is involved in the physical set itself, the capturing of the set, the capturing of the actors, the way it's lit, the art department, the cinematographer um, is responsible for capturing that image and making sure that the set looks the way that he or she um, has visualized it and, in, and what is in accordance with the director's vision. So who has the final say if the cinematographer wants the lights dim and the, and the director says, no, we want to bump it up a little bit, who gets the final word? Um, typically the director, but if there's too much 
discord between the two of them, uh -huh. it's, it can be a hindrance on the flow of the day. So typically a director and cinematographer um, have worked together many times and they have a understanding. Um, and the pre-production process is so incredibly important to iron out any kinks. Mm -hmm. uh, in pre-production, um, the director, production designer, cinematographer, other department heads all congregate and plan out the entire visual look, the color palette, um, and the best way to go about achieving the director's vision and being uh, um, true to the script and the story being told. So going into it, they pretty much know what they're going to capture. If it's planned out correctly, there shouldn't be any major hiccups <laughs> when you're standing there on set. Okay, so a set dresser. Now, I, I've known some. They're the ones that design the sets and put these little things on, correct? Pretty much. Um, a set dresser works within the art department. Um, they work with um, the prop department as well. Now, the difference between set dressing and props is if an actor interacts with it. If this is something the script calls for the actor to pick up and uh -huh. play with, it becomes a prop. If it does not directly interact with an actor, it is set dressing in which it just the, sits there, it's the a set dressing dresser and dresses it to where ah. it's needed. But if the, cinema, if the cinematographer says, oh, this is blocking something that we want to see on camera, they say, set dressing, would you please move that camera left or camera right or upstage, downstage, all that kind I of stuff. I did not know that prop versus dressing. That's Interesting. Yes. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's go to a couple funny names. What's a grip? Well, what is gripping? Grabbing onto something, moving it from place to place. So, grips are the ones who primarily move things on set. But to be, to be much more specific than that, they work under the uh, guidance of the cinematographer to move um, reflectors or what we call um, negative fill which can be um, it, it's all about controlling the light in in the opinion of the cinematographer so if you're dealing with natural daylight they'll use giant reflectors or diffusions and moving those to where the optimal places on set to get that that look um, achieved as well as if there's a big, huge spotlight mm -hmm. um, at the electric, electric department under the tutelage of the gaffer, who we will We're gonna speak about. We're going to go through that next. <laughs> that, light, that light gets planted where the cinematographer wants it, but if that light needs to be cut down or it needs to be diffused or if the light is leaking from the side of it, uh -huh. the grip department put up um, four by four solid flags. There's all these other terminologies. So the grips are the big laborers. And as an things. assistant director, um, safety being paramount, each one of those stands and lights and grippage, as we call it, has to be secured. So if there's a big wind on a big beach exterior, there are grips securing it to the ground, placing sandbags down, um, all sorts of other stuff. We get into moving vehicles and yes. shots in cars. That's a totally different aspect of what a grip does as well. There's so much more that goes into it, but um, grips work under the cinematographer to, to uh, help control the light okay. for each shot. And then the best boy. Okay, so the best boy. That is a funny name. <laughs> it's, it's an old can it term. Be a, can it be a best girl? It can be. I've seen it's have and I've worked with several these of them. Days. It's going to be must a be best politically person. correct. Um, for the sake of, of uh, film history here, it still remains to be called the best boy on the well, call sheets we'll and in the that. credits, we'll work on that. Okay. Um, they are the second in command underneath the key grip and the gaffer. Each grip and electric department have their heads, the key grip and the gaffer, and they both have best boy grip and best boy electrician. Now, say you're on day 20 of a 45 day feature shoot, and on day 37, they need to add on a gigantic additional lighting unit that got determined you know, after the shoot started. The best boy is the one responsible for making sure that that is the correct equipment that's needed and that it's 
relayed to the production heads so that it is there on that day and it's scheduled and it fits within the budget. And they're also there to make sure that all of their crew members in their departments, paperwork is done correctly. So that if there's any overtime, if there's any meal penalties, if there's any other elements that need to go onto the time card for accounting, the best boys are the ones responsible for making sure that's all done correctly so that their department gets uh, their due. Or best girl. Yes. Best okay, girl. We, we, we skipped over the gaffer, didn't we? We or can, did we, did we, can we, we circle kinda, back to that. Yeah, what did, what, uh, okay, description of the gaffer. So since we're in that world, the gaffer deals with all things electric. They're the head of the electric department. Underneath them is a group of electricians or what's referred to as SLT, Set Lighting Technicians is their official name. Um, and each of these departments have their own unions and that's a whole that's another a whole tier another to this <laughs> that your, your audience is not going to want to hear about. It's no. far too boring, but very important nonetheless for the livelihood of the crew members. Uh, the gaffer is typically someone who has a very good working relationship with the cinematographer. They read each other's minds. Um, when, when they know that they're going to be filming in this direction, that gaffer is already thinking about how to light the close-up, which is coming up next. Um, they're the ones who discuss with the cinematographer ahead of time what kind of look they're going for, and that means they need this kind of color temperature in the light bulbs themselves within the lighting units. You're making my head spin. There I are know. too many. I'm sorry. Mi no, no, no. <laughs> that's, they're, they're, that's why you're here. But there's so many minute details that go into these movies that uh, most of us have no clue yeah. as to we just think the director says action and cut and that's it. Uh, let's go to a lead man. Again, we got to change that name. But what's the lead man? The lead man is within the art department. The lead man is the person who is on set for every single shot and knows what that set requires on an artistic level. They work right below the production designer and the art director who um, create the overall look of everything physical that the cinematographer captures through the camera. The lead man is there to say, um, this countertop doesn't have quite enough on it. I think we need to add X, Y, Z here and it needs to be moved to this standard and by doing this I know I'm I'm achieving the vision of my boss the production designer okay so wait a minute so if he wants more on here he will call the dresser and the dresser will find what he needs to correct go. I'm learning okay. but the lead man is there to sign off on it and the lead man will often go to the assistant director and say I'd like to get this set approved and the director will put down his coffee and put his his script down and he'll walk over for three seconds and say more or less too much change this and then the lead man will tell his set dresser go back out to the truck get another shiny silver ball because <laughs> the director wants two shiny balls he makes it happen he makes it happen for the art department yes okay let is let's go to the boom operator i think we know what that is but just do it one more time. Yeah, us. it's the, the man or woman who stands getting really, really tired in his or her arms for an exceptional, exceptionally long amount of time on set with a big microphone hanging off the end of it. Um, the boom operator is someone who's hired by the sound mixer, and depending on what the shot is, what the scene is, there might be multiple boom operators. But the boom operator is also responsible for physically putting a <laughs> microphone on talent when they're on camera. So hiding a microphone underneath the clothing of actors. Almost every time you see an actor on set, unless they're jumping into a pool, they have a microphone on them. Um, or if, if say, a, an actress is wearing something very um, translucent in terms of <laughs> clothing. Nice um, way of putting it. Sheer. <laughs> sheer. They might, um, if she's holding a purse, they might plant a microphone in there. So there's always um, hidden microphones either just off camera drifting mm -hmm. right above the head of the actor on a boom pole which the boom operator is holding um, but they're also responsible for making sure that uh, their sound mixer, their boss who's sitting at the controls capturing the, the practical sound on set is able to get the best quality possible because that'll save time in post-production which we'll get to 
Okay. Uh, well, is, does post-production include um, continuity? Is that what you're... A lot of times I will be watching a movie and somebody's hair is in a ponytail and then two seconds later they're still talking and it's down. Yeah. Who do we blame for that? You blame the script supervisor for uh -huh. that. He or she is sitting with a gigantic pad of notes and the script and is resp responsible for not only making sure the dialogue is correct, but the look of everything is correct and the timing of of when an actor is sitting and gesturing with their right hand so that when this master shot is achieved and you go in for the close-up, that actor also is true to the same timing when you're capturing the other angle. Um, this is especially necessary when you're only working with one or two cameras on set instead of having four or five cameras capturing everything at the same time. Um, if you look at old Hollywood films, mm -hmm. um, where there's always a cigarette being drank or a smoke smoked or a cocktail being drank and suddenly that cigarette is jumping in uh -huh. size. That is what we call continuity. And that is something the script supervisor is also looking out for to try to get the timing of that cigarette lit so it burns evenly so it I all know matches up. Of a lot of times script supervisors have missed the bill on that. They have I mean glass is half full, the glass is it happens quite I'm often. I've always seen that. I happen to notice that as well, but uh, eh. Okay, script supervisors, be warned. We're going to be watching. Yeah. Okay, um, let me ask you, assistant director versus director, what's going on there? Um, I think being an assistant director and a director myself, mm -hmm. um, I have a rather good understanding of this, so I'm going to try to put it as concisely as possible. Um, the director in an ideal world, um, their job gets defined essentially in pre-production. When a director steps on set, he or she shouldn't have to do much other than um, plan the day with the cinematographer and interact with their executive producer and their actors to get those performances right. The actors being the most important obligation that the director has. Now. The assistant director is not there to assist the director in doing those things. Uh -huh. The assistant director is pretty much the voice of God on set. The assistant director is there to make sure that the day runs as efficiently and on schedule and safely as possible. On sets, a lot of times, an assistant director will also call, roll camera, roll sound, and action and then let the director him or herself say cut when they want to end that specific mm -hmm. take. The assistant director comes on board in pre-production and schedules the entire shoot, um, plans it out logistically and within the budget that they're given and in accordance with safety standards and, and laws. But once they're on set, they're the ones saying, all right, crew, this is what we're doing today. This is how we're doing it, and let's do it safely. And supervising every process, saying when an actor should come to set, when they should go away from set, when the cameras are going to move and we have to look the other direction on set. Um, they're the ones interacting with a stunt coordinator, saying, all right, this is how we're going to obtain this dangerous feat safely and, and in the best Absolutely. way possible, yeah. or dealing with animal trainers or, or studio teachers if you've got children talent. There's so many things that go into it and they often say that the life expectancy of an assistant director is about 10 or 15 years less than other crew members just because of the amount of stress they have to go through when they do their job on a consistent basis. And you basis. felt that stress. I have. There's, there's some gray hairs here. <laughs> yes. It's so you uh, like being just a regular director instead? Um, I love being on just set. Just a regular, I shouldn't say just a regular. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, quite all right. I, um, I love being on set in any capacity. I always have. There's yet to be a 4 a.m. call time that I've walked onto a set personally and said, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, there is an adrenaline rush. There is um, a great amount of excitement when it goes, uh, when, when I realize what we're achieving that day and, and something magical that happens when you turn on lights and you turn on a camera and you, you capture something through a camera that will 
essentially be preserved forever. Well, Jack Lemmon used to call it magic time. Yeah, yeah, it really is. That's a, a very good way to put it. Um, but both directors and assistant directors are so essential to the process and the ass assistant directors specifically are there to make sure that the day which is typically 12 hours long, if not a little bit longer, yeah, goes <laughs> as smoothly as possible and as safely as possible. Um, so shouldering that responsibility as an assistant director and achieving that is an amazingly rewarding uh, feeling for me personally. Without the gray hairs. Without the gray hairs, ideally. So back in post, we have an editor who is chopping up everything, making it flow. Is that right? Yes. Or am I wrong? <laughs> no, no, that's uh, spot on. It's a little bit more involved than that. Um, the editor is there to take hundreds of hours when you're dealing with feature films mm -hmm. or television series, hundreds if not thousands of hours of footage and organizing it according to the script, according to the vision of the project. Um, they're the ones pushing the buttons in today's editing you know, digitally. Back in the day, they would be there with yeah. scissors, cutting negatives, and splicing everything together. The process is still essentially the same. The theories behind editing have not changed in 100 years, as if, you know, as most of the technological processes of filmmaking really have not evolved greatly mm -hmm. since the conception of the medium. Um, but the editor is there to tell the story. A lot of times, performances and script writing um, errors can be changed or salvaged in editing itself. It's, it's like the, the final vision being put together um, that falls to the editor. Okay, well now what happens if the editor and the director have opposing views on something? The director still gets this final say? Not always, and this is why you have the term a director's cut. Yes. Directors. My next who, question. Oftentimes, there's um, directors who do not see eye to eye with um, the editor or the essentially executive producers, who are the ones who are really saying this is what our final cut is going to be like. Um, so the editors are. Sorry, we'll take that again. That's okay. I'll try to. <coughs> Um, certain times the editors and directors don't see eye to eye, but they usually find a middle ground and approve a final cut together. Um, in cases where they don't, the editors um, hand off the cut to the director and the director can extend it to their liking, especially if they have a lot of clout there. They're mm -hmm. given a director's cut. Uh, back in film history, um, it used to be in contracts that the director would be the ones to approve final cut. Um, but that's something that typically is um, in the hands of the producers and executive producers and the ones who own the film at the end of the day, the ones who are handing it off to a distributor to mm -hmm. show it to the world. They're the ones who say, yes, this is approved, or no, it needs a little bit more work. And that's why sometimes when we get a Blu-ray or DVD, we have two cuts, the director's cut and the, the theatrical cut. Correct, right. and if you turn on the director's commentary on some of those cuts, you can hear where they're saying, ah, I would have liked to have done that a little differently, or this, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. Okay, now we're going to move on to my dream job, ADR, which is um, automated dialogue replacement. That can be, I mean, this is always, always done in animated films because you don't have the act, the, 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 the duck and everything isn't actually talking, so the, the actor has to go in and put in the voice. It's also done in voiceovers, for you know, if somebody flubs a line, they have to go back and do an ADR, is that right? Correct. Um, many different reasons why you might need to go in and do ADR. Say, for example, you're sitting and having a conversation and your set happens to be right next to an airport and every three minutes you've got a 767 flying over overhead. Well, the cameras are capturing you saying the dialogue and the mouth is moving, but that audio is no good. So ADR, is when that actor, after you have that scene cut together, yeah. goes into a booth and essentially lip syncs to their own mouth. Or if you 
go back into spaghetti westerns when they were dubbing films into multiple languages. They would mm -hmm. have a German actor doing the German dialogue to an Italian film, which is when you get <laughs> lips that don't sync up specifically. But that's technically also ADR. Well, I have had the opportunity to do some ADR for animated. And so we're going to show an ADR clip that I did. See if you can guess which one is me. How do we get started, Builder Man? First things first, we don't do this at all. It's a horrible idea. Oh well, guess I'll build it on my own then. Maybe frosting would work as glue? Three, two... Frosting? A solvent-based adhesive? You need polymers, Poppy! Polymers! Well, now, when you go to the theater and you see the credits roll at the end, you'll have a pretty good idea as to what all these people are doing. And thank you to Nick Brokaw. I didn't find him here just because his last name is the same as mine, <laughs> but because he knows everything about the business. He grew up in it and he's working in it. And what projects do you have coming up now? Well, I just wrapped um, directing and producing a short World War II film called The Last Patrol on Okinawa, Ooh. and that is going to be going into post-production and editing and ADR <laughs> uh, in not too long, and then uh, out to film festivals after that. Well, good luck with that, and if you need anybody for ADR, I'm your guy, your gal. How's your Japanese, actually? Uh, I don't want to offend anybody out there, so <laughs> I, I better not. Well. <laughs> Thank you again for having me. It's been a great Thank pleasure. Thank you. We've learned a lot. Thank you for joining us, Nick Brokaw, Francine Brokaw, and this has been Beyond the Red Carpet. I look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>